Uh, let's get started. Um, we want to get started before we run out of time. Um, your your uh, your um, what the what the thing is a historic event and that this is the beginning of a 30th year of doing these um, breakfasts. Um, we're missing all of our senators there at a meeting in, in the Scotney and uh, they will be with us uh, at subsequent meetings, but this particular meeting they were all on the to attend. One of them said something to me about uh, they had scheduled their appointment in the Scotney before before they know about our meeting and I had to take them to action that we've been doing for 30 years the last Monday of every month. And uh, I make a point in June to tell everyone the dates of the, the next meeting. So that didn't fly. But uh, we'll forgive them and welcome them back when uh, they are able to return. Um, this little housekeeping thing, Alice um, sent me copies of her, her Nitka notes, which I read, didn't fully understand. And I've made copies for uh, myself. Make copies for you, and you can read it, and you can not understand it. Um, it it's Keep always it. nice to have the person here so that they can answer the questions we might have. But, uh, in any case, let's let's begin. Uh, the typical um, scenario is that we ask the uh, legislator, <laughs> legislator was, uh, to talk to us about what they're doing, and. Um, then we open it to questions, and I don't think there's any question that's uh, not, uh, not appropriate as long as you're not rude or, or uh, a foul language. Uh, I'll try to keep it under control. I, I don't really particularly like this job because it prevents me from participating in it. It, uh, it kind of annoys me because a lot of things I'd like to say myself, but I don't get a chance to. So. Maybe I'll stop doing this and have a chance to uh, get into the other side of the bench. There are chairs in here. There's three places to sit in this room. Four. I thought you were driving them out. Good <laughs> work, Sandy. So, Sandy, if you would begin, uh, talk to us a little bit about what the uh, legislative activities activities you are involved with and uh, then we can open the questions. So good morning everyone. First I, first I want to thank David Sandberg for um, for hosting us and, and particularly for the homemade goodies this morning. That is, that's really a treat. Um, and, um, and to Neil and the American Legion for um, sponsoring. This is, it really is amazing that we've been doing, that, they, that this event has been happening in Bethel for 30 years. Um, and right, we do it every every single month during the session, um, and and some kind of wrap up after the session. Um, uh, Neil already um, told you about our senators, uh, uh, Alice Clarkson, Alice Allison Clarkson, Alice Nitka, and Dick McCormick all send their regrets. The event in Escutney is an annual meeting of the hospital board, and as you know, the senators represent the whole county. So it's really they really do have to kind of figure out how to. Um, a portion of their time amongst their, I don't know, 20-something, the 20-something towns that they represent. Um, so where are we? Um, so first of all, I'm Sandy Haas. Um, I uh, represent the towns of Rochester, Bethel, Stockbridge, and Pittsfield. Um, I've been uh, in the house now for, um, this is my 14th year. Uh, I serve as vice chair of the House Human Services Committee, and I've been doing that for several years. I've kind of lost track. Um, and where we are in the legislative process is that this, we are now in the second year of the biennium. Now, what, the, the, way, the way the process works, we, we work in, in the legislature is, is elected every two years. So every two years, we have arguably a new legislature. Um, and, um, and so we have been in, those of us who are there now have been in office since a year ago, January. Um, and. Um, and all of the bills that are, were, have been introduced since last January are still on the table, or as we like to say, on the wall, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, 
but um, just for your, you know, just for your information, we've had uh, 743 bills introduced in the House as of uh, um, this week, and uh, 296 bills introduced in the Senate. And just to put that, put that in some, so that's over a thousand. And just to put that in some perspective, um, last session in, in 2017, the two, the the legislature, the House and the Senate together, passed 87 bills. So most of the 1,000 bills will continue to be what I like to call slips of paper in a suggestion box. And I, I, I say that, uh, you've heard it before, it's a little boring, I know, but, but I think it's important because, because the press often picks up the, um, the most outrageous bills they can find to write articles about. And excuse me, Tim, but sometimes, sometimes news is about, is about getting headlines. And although our local paper would never do that, uh, um, you know it is. You know you will you will hear you will often hear on the news about some wild and crazy idea that somebody has had because because it's you know it's something to talk about. Um, the reality is that a lot of the stuff that we do is 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 tweaks to the law that make government work better. And I'm, I may get to a couple of those, but they're pretty boring. Um, so um, so that's so. In the second, so we're still we still have all the bills that we've had since last January. They are still arguably under consideration. But the important piece of this is that um, in the second year of the biennium, the second session, um, we have something called called a crossover deadline. And this year, that deadline is before town meeting. It's the Friday before town meeting. So right now we have five weeks left before crossover. And what that means is that any bill that hasn't been voted out of committee on the House side will be essentially dead for the, for the whole term. And any bill that hasn't been voted out of the Senate side by that date will be totally dead. For, and and in a, the new legislature that comes in next January, any of, those, uh, any of those slips of paper in the suggestion box will have to be reintroduced and start all over again. And we do that, and, it, and that happens a lot. I mean, there, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of issues that um, often start as, um, uh, as an idea that is introduced and sits, and, and sits on the table for one term, two terms, five terms, and then finally gets serious traction. One of those that I would talk about was the, is the end of life bill that I worked really hard on. Um, we worked on that for 10 years before we finally got it across the finish line. So, um, uh, and that's, um, and you will, and, and, I'm, and on that list is something called carbon pricing. Um, where that is, that is, you've got a lot of press, it's one of those really controversial things that gets lots of headlines. Um, that's not gonna happen. Um, maybe there'll be a study, that, that's not gonna happen this year. And you know maybe there'll be a, maybe there'll be a study of the economic implications, which would be kind of interesting. But I'm not even sure about that. But but the the bills get introduced as a way of getting um, both legislators' attention and public attention to issues that people feel are important. And so so that so just keep that in mind when you see those headlines. Send me a, send me an email and say is this bill moving? Because I can because I I can answer that. You can also find that yourselves. Um, I don't know how many of you have um, have played on the internet with with the legislative website, but it's really very very informative. Um, you can it's uh, Vermont.gov will get you to the homepage. Um, you can go to the committees and you can see what's going on in every committee room, um, including including witness testimony, the do the documents that they present that they bring us. Um, often we get presentations that are powerpoints and those are posted and they can be pretty easy to follow. Um, there's, you can see the, um, also on the main, on the, on the home page, um, you'll see on the one side is the House, and on the other side is the Senate, and if you scroll down, you can read the calendar. The calendar is, so if you go there today, you will see the House calendar for tomorrow, calendar in other, in the rest of the world would be called an agenda, um, and that tells you what we're doing tomorrow. Um, and there's there's two sections of that. There's the action section and the notice section. So things things that are listed for action are things that we're in all probability <coughs> really going to talk about tomorrow. There always there always are exceptions to everything I'm saying. I'll come back to that. Um, and um, and the things that are on notice are things that in the in the usual course would come up for business for, for debate 
on the following legislative day, which in this case would be Wednesday. Um, and the same thing for, this, for the Senate. Below that, you'll see a reference to something called the journal. Think of journal as minutes. Um, and, and the journal tells you, if you click on, if you go there today, you will see the journal for last Friday. Um, and it will tell you everything that happened in the House, on, the, the House journal will tell you everything that happened in House floor action, and the Senate journal will tell you Senate journal action. In addition to that, um, if you go to, if you click on committees, and you go over to the right side, you'll see a place where it says um, complete committee schedule, I think is what they call it. Um, and so you can, uh, today, you can go in and you can see what every single committee is doing all week. Now, again, there are changes. That, that's, that, that, is, that is subject to change. And if there's something that you're really interested in, you should be double checking that on a daily basis because, because witnesses change, things get bumped. Um, sometimes we plan an entire afternoon on something and we don't get back to committee because there was a debate on the floor. So things, so that's, that's a little bit more fluid. But, but, it is our, but we all have committee assistants who are very good at keeping that information as, as close to up to date as possible. Um, so, so five weeks, there are five weeks left and where are we? Well we did, so the governor did sign the marijuana bill last week. Um, and um, to be very, if you read, uh, Tim had, I think, the, the governor's um, uh, <coughs> statement uh, about that in the paper, which was, which was really good because he told you the things that it does and the things that it doesn't do. What that bill does is it says that as of July 1st, it will no longer be a crime to possess an ounce or less of marijuana, and it will no longer be a crime to have two mature plants and four immature plants. That's about all it says. There's lots of other stuff in there about highway safety, about uh, education, about prevention, um, um, and, uh, and there's even more coming on highway safety. But that's all. So there's, there's no sale. Um, there's, you can't have more than that. You can't smoke in public. Uh, can't, give it, can't give it to children. Certainly can't sell it to children, and ch oh, ex or excuse me, it's not just children. It's anyone under 21. So we're using we use the same um, age cutoff <coughs> for marijuana that we have for alcohol, which is not which is not when you get to vote and not when you get to go die in a war. Okay, so those are uh, not when you get to buy cigarettes. So that's and and with respect to any further action on that topic. Uh, the governor has a commission. It is continuing to meet. They have uh, issued a preliminary report that's, um, that I found with some difficulty. And I can't, oh, I, okay, yes. They finally found it on, so another thing, so we're back, I'm back, we're back, we're back to the legislative website. <laughs> Across the top, um, one of the things that it says is reports. And if you click on that, you can see reports that, that, that are generated by the legislature, reports that come to us. And I did find the, the, the preliminary marijuana commission report there. Um, we do, and that's, while, while we're on reports, that's one of the things that we spend um, a fair amount of time on is actually um, what I would call government oversight. Um, you know, we, when, we, when we pass a law um, and we want, um, Let's say. Uh, oh well, I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about pre pre kindergarten education in a minute. So I'll talk about that. So so we so we passed a pre the pre K bill several years ago, and it's been slowly rolling out. Well, how's it going? How many kids are doing it? Where are they going? You know, it is is are, is it paid? You know, are you know what's what do the economics look like? We get those kinds of reports, and. Um, and the worst thing that we can do to our, to our hard-working government officials is make them put together a fancy report and then not read it. So, so we try to devote a fair amount of committee time to listening to those, to, to hearing those reports. Um, and often, in, um, the, the um, government, the commissioners and deputy commissioners are very good about about not just giving us a report that goes on for 50 pages, but giving us a PowerPoint with kind of the highlights. So, so or what, what we sometimes refer to as the executive summary, so that you can get an idea of what's going on, and then if you really want to drill down further on a particular piece of it, the, the, the detailed information is there. 
Um, so back to marijuana. So that's so there's a preliminary report. The um, the the commission will issue a final report in December. Uh, they were very clear that their mission is not whether we should have a tax and regulated market, but how to get there. That is because Massachusetts is going to have a tax and regulated market, I think as of next summer. I'm not clear about my dates on when that happens. And the same in Maine. And as you might have read, um, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau is talking about doing the same thing in Canada. So we are going to be surrounded by folks um, who, there are some people who see this as an economic opportunity. That's controversial, I get it. Um, and and I, am, I feel very strongly that although, although it would be nice to have the tax revenue, I'm not going to vote for this just to get the money. I think that's stupid. So, um, um, you know, it has, we have to have a system that is designed to make sure that, that the product is, is, is safe, um, that, the, that, the, that, we're, that we're basically shutting down the black market. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, and one of the reasons that it's taken so long is that it's actually pretty complicated. Um, when, although the Senate passed a bill um, a couple, three years ago, I guess, um, to, to do a tax and regulate, um, it, has, it has a job for the, for the Agency of Agriculture, it has a job for the Department of Health, it has a job, we, right now we have our, our, our medical program is actually run through the Department of Public Safety, which, is, which also houses the state police. And, and it works. It's a, it's, a, it's a very, very well-regulated system, the best in the country. Um, uh, what happens with banking? So now, now we're bringing in financial regulation. So there's, there are jobs for lots and lots and lots of government folks who, who and that, those need to be thought out. And that's, you know, one of the reasons that, that I'm really happy that Vermont does not have an initiative process, like California, where I used to live, is that, is that we do have this legislative process. Things go to, you know, let, let's, let's talk about that. So, so if, it, if those four different agencies were involved in one bill, that means that, it, that the bill would go to four different committees in each, on each side, in the House and also in the Senate, because everything I described about the bills, it all happens twice. It happens once on the House side, if, if it's a House bill, and then when it gets to the Senate, it starts the process all over again with the same, with the committees of jurisdiction looking at it. Um, and it's, so it's, it's a heavy lift, to be really honest. And, and with the initiative process, um, what, you, what you end up passing, if it passes, is what I call a rough draft. Uh, or, or what in legislative terms is called bill as introduced. Uh, and we almost never pass a bill as introduced unless it's been very, very, very carefully written and probably been through those several years of, of conversation that I talked about earlier. Um, so, shifting gears. Um, the other thing we did last week was we, the House passed um, a, a highway safety bill that includes primary enforcement for um, use of seatbelts. Um, you, may, you may not even know that, um, that we have had in place a seatbelt law for many years, and I don't remember how many, um, that says that if, if the state police see you driving without a seatbelt, they can't stop you unless you're doing something else wrong. You can have, have tail light out, you ran a, ran a speed light, Speed, speed sign, you cross the center line. You have to have, they have to have some other traffic reason to stop you. And then once they've stopped you for that, they, then they can say, oh, I, uh, I noticed, uh, David, I noticed that you're not wearing your seatbelt. You know, and, and, and I, I'm not even, I'm not sure about this, but I think they have to write tickets for both. I think if they, I think if they don't really ticket you for the, for crossing the center line, they can't ticket you for, for seatbelts. Anyway, we have, the House has talked about this for years. I believe this is the fourth time I have voted for primary enforcement. Um, and, and we send it to the Senate and um, the, the, there are powerful senators who have not liked it in the past. I believe that the tide is turning. Um, the, we had several people in the House stand up during debate on Friday, <coughs> Thursday and Friday and, and talk about um, you know, their own personal conversion to the need to wear a seatbelt. Um, and, and the statistics, the statistics are that we could cut, we could cut highway fatalities in half. Not, not 
a, a small goal. So uh, we are very hopeful. So we're done. We, 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 we did our work. We sent it to the Senate. And, and now we'll see what happens over there. And so if you feel strongly about that, you might reach out to our three senators. I, I believe that all three of them will support, although I haven't, I haven't spoken to all of them. Um, OK. Um, governor's budget address was last Tuesday. You might have read about that in the paper. Um, I can't tell you too much about it because we're just starting to um, to get the real numbers. Um, he talked a lot about new things that he wants to do, but he's doing it within existing appropriation. So what that means is that we're going to lose stuff to make the new stuff happen. And I'm very interested to see what we're going to lose because um, I think about 50% of our budget is in various human services uh, areas, and so that means cuts to human services, and so that's my committee is going to be looking very closely at that. Um, what we do, there are 11 of us on the committee, uh, and uh, Madam Chair assigns us each to, um, <coughs> to some piece. I worked last last year with um, with a member from uh, Manchester. Uh, on, uh, we did economic services and child protection. Uh, other people will do um, uh, uh, disability issues. Other people will do elder issues. So there's, uh, we don't, our committee does not do straight Medicaid. Um, that is handled by the healthcare committee. Um, that's a huge, that's a huge number. Um, so we haven't, so we're, we're, we're still ready to take a look at that. Um, the big, one of the big issues that I'm concerned about this year that my committee is working on, and we're going to have to, whatever we do, we're going to have to do in the next five weeks, um, is re relates to pre-K education. Um, that, I don't even remember what year that, what, what year the law was passed. We did, we've done it, we did it in, in stages. Um, the first one was maybe 10, 10 years ago. There was a kind of like voluntary, you know, well, let's 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 have a pre-K program, and anybody who wants to do it can do it. And, and we didn't want to limit it to public schools because most children that age are actually in some kind of childcare setting. Um, and and we didn't want to put the childcare providers out of business. We didn't. And I, what I didn't want is I actually didn't want three-year-olds to be. Um, rustled into their into their snowsuits to go two out to go for two hours to, to, to be rustled out to stay for two hours to be rustled back in and, and go you know it just it seemed to me that it made sense to bring education to the kids so I liked I liked the idea of the well you can do it in a pu public school that's what we do in, in Rochester we have we have our um, Lisa, Lisa knows Lisa knows Triple E from forever so the the early uh, early essential education program was expanded several years ago to sort of incorporate um, provision of services for pre-K for everybody if they wanted to come. So, um, but, but we also have, I'll, I'll, I'll pick an easy, an easy place, the, I think it's the YMCA in, in Burlington has a huge child care program. I don't know how many hundreds of kids are there. Um, so they're already there. Uh, uh, they have a, a license, they have licensed people, they have trained people who are there taking care of kids for whatever it is, probably 10 hours a day by the time the parents add in uh, 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 commuting. Uh, so, so, so my child is there for 10 hours and for two hours a day there's a licensed teacher who will take the kids aside and do the pre-K program. Uh, and it may, be, and it may be somebody who already works with a Y who, who has a, a teaching license. Um, so there's we have we have licensed centers like like the YMCA that can be huge. We also have licensed and registered home care providers, um, and that actually that's a that's a good system because um, you know I, I have a neighbor who you know she had her second child and she said I can't afford to go to work and pay child care. Why don't I just be a child care provider? So they did a lot of work on their house and they and they and they jumped through all the the hoops. To um, to get a license for her to take kids in, um, and we we have we we have an unlicensed um, uh, 
there's an exception for a fam for somebody who takes in children from not more than two other families. So I could have my kid, and I could have your kid, and I could have your kid, or two of each. Two each. Um, I think. I think the. And I, I don't know what the numerical limit is, but it's but it's based on it's based on 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 two other families. Um, so those are, that's that's the that's the landscape of childcare. Um, when they did the when they when they did the expansion to try to get more kids involved in the program, they um, they limited where they would do the reimbursement to pe to places that were licensed and had um, a certain quality rating. I'm not going to go into that because I don't totally understand it. It's, 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 well, it's, it's, they call it stars, and there's, there's categories of things, and you have to have so many points in each, in each category. And um, uh, five, a five-star child care center is, is top of the line in your home. Um, and, 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 they, and they said that it, you had to have at least four stars to to be able to be reimbursed because they get these, so these so these child care providers who are who have a, a teacher and are providing pre-k on-site get I think it's about thirty-one hundred dollars a year so that helps that helps parents helps you know, argue, hope, hopefully helps the child care center um, the problem has been with the rollout that um, that we don't have the participation that we had hoped. It is a voluntary program. Parents don't have to send their kids. I, do, I can decide that that you know my four-year-old isn't going anywhere, uh, and, um, and it's not it's not mandatory. Um, but we were really hoping that we would have more children who are kindergarten ready, and so so we really wanted to get get as as much buy-in across the state as we as possible, and it is. Um, it's hampered by um, by the way that we do our child care subsidy. Um, we have um, we have we get so it's a bunch of money. We get we get a lot of money from the federal government. I think it's maybe forty million dollars. Uh, it's a forty eight million dollar program right now that we use to um, subsidize low income people to for so they can go to work basically. Um, and but childcare is expensive. I mean, think about it. It's, I mean, I I have I have friends who say that they who who don't get a subsidy, who have who have income, who um, who say that their childcare bill is more than their mortgage. So it's 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 a it's a chunk of change to send a kid to, to childcare. Uh, some some parents decide they're just not going to work, and you'll hear that from from from, from friends and neighbors that, 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 that I can't afford to go to work. Um, other people, you know, A, they sort of want, they, they have careers and they don't want to fall completely off the track in their careers. B, they, although playing with three-year-olds is really fun, maybe you don't want to do it 24 hours a day. Maybe you'd like to have a few <laughs> hours of doing something different. Um, so, um, so we have this program. It's, it is, it is, it is, it's means tested, completely means tested, um, that allow, that gives parents who don't ha who can't afford to pay the full the full freight, uh, a subsidy. Problem is that right now our child care subsidy is based on 2010 market rates. Um, it's a got the federal got the, the, well it's, it's a money it's a money issue. <laughs> it's about money. Um, um, the federal guidelines say that we are supposed to pay the 70, it's hard to say, I can't, I can hardly say this. It's, we're supposed to pay at the 75th percentile of the market rate. What that means is that if I'm getting a check, if, if I'm getting a subsidy from the state, I should have access to 75% of the providers in my area, in my region. And, and, it, and it's regionally different, by the way. We, it's a statewide rate. We talked about maybe going to a regional subsidy, but we're not there yet. But but in but I should I should have access. There should there shouldn't be more than 25% of the providers that I that that I that, that I can't get in if I'm getting a full subsidy. Well, so but the problem is that that's based on 2010 market rates. So in fact, right now I think I think 
we're down to about less than 50%. I have access to less than 50% of providers if I am getting a full um, a full subsidy. And to get a full subsidy, you have to basically, you're po we're talking poverty level, people who are poverty level. Um, so, um, so what that's done is, is, is it's, it's meant that fewer needy, excuse me, fewer economically disadvantaged people are, are, use, are taking advantage of the subsidy. They're just not doing it. They're getting, they're getting, you know, Aunt Hilda to take the kid. And maybe Aunt Hilda just watches TV all day. We don't, you know, we don't know. We don't have, it's not, it's, we don't, we, we don't have any information. We certainly don't have any regulatory power. Um, and, um, and so we, we, we would really like to see, um, we'd like to see, and if, if I'm not, in, if I'm not in a, in a licensed center, then I'm not getting pre-K. Unless, unless, unless Aunt Hilda is driving me to, unless we, unless A, we, she lives in Rochester where we have a program, or Bethel. Right. You, you have all day here as well, don't you? Yeah. I'm not sure what the program is here. I'm, yep. I'm up in Williamstown. Okay. So yes, yeah, it's, all it's, all day. Day. it's all day. It's all day. So, so maybe, maybe Aunt Hilda will drive me d downtown for, the, for my two hours a day, and maybe she won't. So maybe, maybe Aunt Hilda doesn't even have a car. We don't, you know. So we have a, we have, Basically, we have an access issue, and we're, and um, um, the pre-K structure was 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 birthed in the um, in the education committees in the House and Senate, um, and we never really had uh, a whole lot of input on the human services side, and since it relies so heavily on on the existing human services structure. Um, my committee is, is, is doing a deep dive on that issue, and I'm really hoping that we can, that we can have something, um, a committee bill together before crossover, but we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to scoot to make that happen because we have a bunch of little bills that we've been working on. Um, I think, okay. yeah, I think with that, I'm gonna stop talking yeah. and let you ask questions. Yeah. Just a few questions and no answers, or you can give me an answer if you can. The Medicaid is under the umbrella of DCF, am I correct? No. No? Under what? Uh, Medicaid is handled by um, a department called uh, DIVA, Department of Vermont Health Access. Okay. And who is responsible for day-to-day -day operations of Medicaid? Uh, Commissioner of DIVA, I should know, uh, and at the moment I'm blank, but give me a minute and it may come back to me. Um, okay, give me, give that. That's okay. Sorry. And who oversees the workers that work for Medicaid? Who do they respond to? I, you, mean the, you mean DIVA? Or, yeah. I mean. Whoever handles Medicaid. People working for Medicaid. Well, right? okay, so the. So Medicaid is a program, so you don't work for Medicaid. So there's so there's there are folks in the hospital who manage who who handle Medicaid issues. Right. There are folks in government who handle Medicaid issues. So if you could tell me what the question is, I might be able. To well, I'm dealing with some dips there in in, in Medicaid, mm -hmm. in the ID situation, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you. Well, call. I, I lived on state police nations, but I tell you, these people are acting worse than than Nazis. Okay. All right, all right. Um, I will. I will get back to you, and we'll work up to, on that together. Um, okay. So that that was all. The, I, I was hoping Dick would be here today to give me some answers because he helped me last year. Um, but the question of overseeing the workers. It seems to me that they give them a free hand. Whoever is in charge, and apparently nobody knows who is in charge, and they can. A simple question. They are asking where Heidi spent $5,000 in 2013. Okay? Oh that, was, oh, that was with respect to eligibility. I remember this question. Okay. All right. Yeah. Why the hell do they want to know what the hell she spent the money in 2013? Uh, I, I believe it relates to eligibility, but... but I, I, what is the I, relation to it? That's what I'm saying. And the other thing, too, she had a stroke three years ago. Now they want proof that she had the stroke. Well, that's they approved it last year, Medicaid, 
we have to go through the same crap again this year. Proof that she had a stroke. And prior to the stroke, she was in good health. I'm spending hours and hours every day trying to sort these things. Finally, I had to hire a lawyer to answer all these questions if he can. And everybody I talk in the state, they tell me, well, you know, more or less they're in the dark. That's what I'm saying. Who oversees that diva or daba or whatever you told me? Okay, all right. I, I promise to get back to you on that, Nick, and I'll work with Dick and see what, where, what he did last year. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Could I comment on this just a little bit? Because yeah. I've had a little exposure to the same situation yeah. with my in-laws. Um, what I'm seeing um, is that the, 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 the people who need the benefit don't know how to approach government. There seems to be a, a, a misconnect there someplace. Big. Mm -hmm. Big misconnect. And th there should be somewhere in there um, navigators of some kind that can kind of help the people who need the benefits get through the state system. Well, we do have an ombudsman. Uh, and, and, and ombudsman? No, an office, an office of the ombudsman. And, the, and the, that, he has. That might be where the thing is breaking down. So, that's, so that? that's Mike Fisher. What is that? There you go. So, well, so, so, the ombudsman is is a is a is a is a troubleshooter. That's what they do. Uh, they that's, work for the state. Uh, no, uh, they are housed in uh, legal aid. And who supplies them? Who who is responsible for their money and all? Uh, we make there is a there is a uh, an appropriation to legal aid for that program, mm -hmm. but it's independent of government. And I that's tried my, to my, use I my tried teacher. to use them. Uh huh. And. Got a phone, uh, a message on the phone. Due to the extreme load of cases we have, do not expect to hear from us at least three weeks from now. So that's great. How help. long ago? When was? When did you do that? Last year. Last year. Okay. So I gave up on that. I mean, if you okay. can't, you know, hear from them at all. No. Okay. Did you leave the message? Yes, I did. Uh, all right. So that, that's what I see the where, where the thing is falling down. I'll talk to Fisher about that. That's, that, that's that, that would be a big help. Okay. You know, a typical elderly Vermont person uh, doesn't know how to get through the system, so they could use a little, just a little guidance, just a little help. Absolutely. And, and, and another thing I was going to tell Dick, too, and all, if you remember two years ago that a, a murder happened in Barry from a, 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 a state worker or a case Social worker? worker. Yep. Right. Oh, Laurel okay. Civil, yeah. I'm not defending the, uh, the, the shooter. I mean, she gone right in jail, whatever they said. But they are pushing so hard, the people who are looking for this information and everything. As a matter of fact, the first time I called about Medicaid, they send you the papers and they send the papers. It takes eight days to come from Waterbury to Bethel. And they want the answer in 10 days. So I call up and I call that person, can't you send it a little earlier? You know, I mean, it's ridiculous to do that way. You know, I don't have the time to answer all these questions. The answer of that person was, sir, you throw punches at us, we can throw punches at you too. That was the answer. So I have very high respect for these people who are working there. So that's my case. <clears throat> so as I said, my lawyer is working on that, it's cost me a lot of money, which I don't really have, but I have to do it for high. And then the state tells me everything's hunky-dory, you know, it's just fine. So, that's my case, so proceed with the rest now. I'm done. Other questions, comments, people want to make? <coughs> I'm uh, curious yeah. what's going on with, uh, if there's any, going to be any adjustments made to the vehicle inspection law. I understand that, um, that, that, that may be, um, what's the word that I want to say? Put on hold for a while. That's okay. that's what I'm hearing. You are not the first person who's raised that. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I, I just I got word on a car that I own that it will not pass inspection next year I, because I, of the sensor that does have anything. To so do yeah, here. I know. <laughs> it's, um, I I got I got to buy um, I got to buy a new sensor for my tire for two hundred dollars. Yeah. Now waiting to have to do the other three. Yes. That's crazy. Yes. That's crazy. Yes. Yes. So um, what does David do? Um, well, I, as, I, as, as, I, as I said, there's, um, there are, so, okay, 
So we had, they put some of, some of the things, were the whole thing I think was put on hold at one point. Um, there has been an effort to try to distinguish between things that are truly safety related yeah. and not. Mm -hmm. um, that got a little bit ugly last year because because one of the things was really related to air pollution, so it was, it was a little bit mis misrepresented. Um, uh, but I heard the other day informally that uh, they were thinking about about like going back to the drawing board for three years. But I don't know that for sure. I will. I will. It's, it's you're not the first person that I've heard this from, and I. I mean, you, you, you have. You live in Vermont, you live on a back road. You don't want to go out and buy a $40,000 car that's going to get destroyed in a year. You know, you buy a clunker. And, you know, yeah, it's like, I understand safety issues, but a sensor that's going to cost probably $3,000 just to get to. Just, just for fun, what's, so what's your sensor, David? Sorry. I don't I can remember what it is. Okay. It's, a, it's not a Volvo, so it's, you know, it's. it's oh, a, a oh, you have a Volvo. Yeah, Volvo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, you know, it's like, oh, man, you know. But anyway, it's, it's, it's very frustrating. And I have other friends that have got the same problem. They're, they're, you know, they're having a hard time making ends meet. And they, they keep, all of a sudden, their car doesn't pass inspection because of something silly. that right. doesn't have anything to do with safety. Right, 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 right. You know, you have a fog light on. You may not ever use the fog lights. <laughs> you know, I had one car I had. I had the, I, they ripped the fog lights out so it would pass inspection. <laughs> well... <laughs> it was going to cost more to have the fog light replaced than it was to have it ripped out. <laughs> so, I, all these regulations are, I don't know who thinks about it and why they're doing it. When I was in business years ago, I had an inspector for the health department come in. First time I see him, I said, hi, how are you doing and everything? I've never seen him before. Oh, I just started the job. I'm an inspector. And what would you do before? I was an electrician. From an electrician, he became a health inspector. And they only go like, he says, turn right. That's it. I turn right and I see a newspaper down on the floor. That's a violation, you know. Why? And the other thing I understand, that the health department, they have a terrible time recruiting people because of money. Yeah. Health inspectors, they brought three or four of them from out of state. Everything's hunky dory when they found out how much the state pays. Goodbye. Well, keep in mind, Nick, that you don't want to pay any more taxes. So that's the trade off. No, you that's know? not the point of not, you know, if you stop spending the money of the state or of the people the way we're spending right now, you would have enough money to do it. Yeah. Well, of course, you know, we don't know anything. We there, have a little people. <laughs> you know? I, 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 I realize that we disagree on this, but no, I but there but there are trade-offs, yeah. and and um, and you know I've I've been there now for 13 years, and 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 I have watched them cut this and cut that and cut this and cut that, and I know that's not what you see on your side, but what 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 we see are the things that we're losing. Um, for example, um, we just had testimony a couple of weeks ago about um, uh, in the. Uh, in economic services, which is the folks that decide um, who needs uh, who needs uh, heating assistance, who needs uh, 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 our our version of welfare, which is called uh, reach up, uh, they're cutting uh, and food stamps. They're they're cutting the the, the staff across the state by um, by twelve by nine positions. So those are they're, 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 they're middle level managers. It's a good you know, and we were satisfied that probably that that work can be covered, but but what it means is it means that the person that you call when you call somebody for help is is going to have less supervision. Will will there be will will things go wrong? Probably they will. Will they go wrong to the tune of of the of nine of nine salaries and benefits? Maybe not, you know. But those those are the kinds of those are the kinds of trade offs. That that state government has to make, and that and that we have to make. And in fact, that particular cut um, didn't didn't require legislative approval. They're, they're, they just told us they're doing it, and yeah. um, you know, and we could we could say no, you can't. But they didn't have to come to us for permission. So 
So they, 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 they're ha there's, a, there's a constant effort to try to figure out where do we want to put our dollars? Do we want the dollars to be answering the phone when Nick calls and says, I need help, or oh, we'll get back to you in three weeks? Or do we want the dollars to go for the person who's looking over that worker's shoulder to make sure that she's checking all the right boxes on the, on the eligibility? Because, of course, nobody in this room wants us to give money to anybody who doesn't, who doesn't deserve it, right? We'll, Nick, Nick will agree with that one. Okay. We will, you know, I understand that. We can talk the whole day, so I'm going to stop here. But I have a stack of papers that high that contradict, contradict what they tell me the first day and then next week. One person tells me one thing, the other one says, no, it's not so, we gotta go. Who do you believe anymore? In other words, the state is broken, the system is broken totally, and we are talking of a lot more new things to safety on the cars that a little red light came on, so we have to take care of that first. Years ago, there was a commercial, I don't know who was doing that, that Republicans or Democrats, they will put a lady in a wheelchair, they wheel her over to the cliff and they put her right down you know, throwing down, I don't know what it was that about, health care or whatever. But it seems to me that the state is doing the same thing, or at least part of the state. And that's it, that's my last word, I'm not saying anything anymore. You can quote me, this is one of the new bill come up on your, your cars, on your inspection thing. Mm -hmm. And the commission was on, or he was on, he said, I want to make sure that when I'm driving down the road, that somebody come in the opposite direction with a faulty car doesn't hit and kill me or my family. Now, how many problems you've had because of faulty equipment versus somebody on a cell phone or DUI? What What is the percentage of that? Oh, that's a good and question. And we're beginning to be thrown down our throat <laughs> for costs. That's, that's a great question. I will, I will look at that. Um, uh, yeah, uh, faulty equipment. So the, the cell phone thing, um, is is horrible. Um, we in the highway safety bill that we that the House passed last week. Um, we we did not do anything more on on texting, but the um, the chair when he presented the bill, the transportation chair, said that we really do need to do that. Uh, and I understand that the chair of Senate Transportation is very interested in that. Um, I'm hearing horrible stories from friends of, you know, seeing somebody who's doing this as they're driving down the road. Um, what does it cost to administer the program from the state on your car inspections? Because you have a television in up there. If you, if I go into the gas station, or the, the garage, and they monitor my car, mm -hmm. and if it doesn't pass, I can't go to another one. Mm -hmm. Now, you got Big Brother up there watching you, and you can't go to another one. Now, who? What does this cost in another that's, bureaucracy? That's interesting. I'm not find it. I was so, on the phone with uh, Commissioner Ives discussing this matter specifically, and he announced to me on Vermont Edition that there's no cost to the taxpayer for the <laughs> there's no there will be no cost to the taxpayer for the equipment <laughs> and the services provided for this overreaching inspection. And but it costs, when I go into the garage to get inspected, it costs right. double what it costs. Right. Yeah, and it cost, it cost the inspector, the actual service station, about $2,200 to gear up for it. He's got to but get somewhere. There's no cost to the state. Now, Somebody I said up to, in Montpelier is running this thing. I, I, I know. That was the quote from Commissioner Ives, live on the radio. And um, so we have all the software. Um, the inspection stations have to pay for the equipment, yeah. they have to be trained on the equipment to then deny a, uh, a public person inspection that cost $45 for a, a blinker light or a, 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 an air valve that's out. Yeah. Now, just with this technology and tires, it's going to cost most people with a new car between two and $300 to have air valves properly. Okay. So I said to the, I said to the uh, commissioner, it's sad that we don't have the people voting on these things and speaking up. And I'm tired of the state house pushing these kinds of ridiculous rules down on people that can't even afford to get to work. Okay. So I just want to be so, clear that the state house had nothing to do with that. Um, that, was, um, that was something that was done by the administration under their administrative authority. 
uh, and we have been, in fact, trying to push back. We did have we had a bill last year that that um, the compromise was was to delay enforcement for another year. So we're just now. So so we would have been having this conversation last spring, and we're having it now instead. So just be clear that there are things that are just done that the administration has a lot of power, um, and um, and we have we have the power, arguably. To, to do a little time out on something that they're doing. But keep in mind the legislative process. So the House can have a bill, and it has to get it passed, and then it has to get it to the Senate where it goes through three committees, and then it goes to the Senate where it goes through two or three committees. So it's, with rare exception, we don't do that fast. I, I did, we did do it once. Once I came to this room, uh, I think my second year, and I told the story of the Medicare Part D fix. You may recall that when the federal government first rolled out Medicaid, Medicare Part D, which is the drug benefit that they, I'm being taped, so I shouldn't say they screwed it up, but I will anyway. Um, they, it, it was a mess. It was a disaster. And, um, and what happened was that um, people, people on like January 3rd, couldn't get their prescriptions filled because because of the of the glitches. In that particular case, we heard about it. We drafted a bill. Uh, somebody somebody stayed late one night. The, the the day we heard about it, he stayed late and drafted a bill. We passed it on the House side at nine o'clock in the morning. They passed it in the Senate side at one o'clock in the afternoon, and the governor signed it the following morning. For the most part, that's not the way you want laws made, folks. It sounds, it sounds really cool, but in fact, you know, going back to what I said earlier about the initiative process, it's one of the reasons, the legislative process is a good thing. You know, it's, 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 it's it, first of all, you all get a chance to see what's going on and write me a letter or, or say I want to testify. Um, sometimes there, there are certain issues for which we have public hearings where everybody can come and talk for, for their two or three minutes. We're going to have one tomorrow night. The Senate is having one on various gun bills that are, that are in the Senate. Um, that will be well attended, I promise you. Uh, they did one on minimum wage last week. Um, so those, the public hearings tend to happen in the evening. Um, the, oh, back, back to the website. I'll keep going back to the website. So when you go, when you go to vermont.gov, on the right-hand side, you sort of have greatest hits on the right. And, and that will have things like, in, like um, the, pu the next public hearing. Like, what are the public hearings on deck? Uh, uh, they, they try to have sort of the most topical issues right there on the um, um, in a newspaper. You know, that's the, the, the lead story is always on the on the right hand column. So that's where the that's where the lead stories are on the web on the web page, and that includes the public hearings. Um, so there are there are issues where we really want to hear from people. This 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 car inspection thing has been a nightmare. Um, one of the problems with the bill that we had last year. I, I believe that the that the proposed fix was a little bit mis misrepresented. We had someone who was really pushing it, who said that that we should all sign on to his bill to a, a fix um, because it was not safety related. It was air quality related, and um, and so you know to the extent that we care about the environment, there was it, 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 we should have at least known what we were signing. Um, I, and I felt I felt like it was. I felt like that kind of got glossed over. So that, what that did was it was it made people mad because of the, you know because they felt like like they weren't being told the whole truth. You know you hear a lot about the lobbyists in our building um, and especially in Washington. We have well we have them too. I think they're um, I don't think they're quite as bad as what it, I know they're not as bad as what I hear about Washington. I've been there, um, but but one of the things that the folks at the state house have learned is that they damn well better tell us the truth. So when, when, when a lobbyist comes to me and says, you know, we really want, um, I don't know, I'm not going to come up with a good example right now, but, but we care about this. Um, you know, the question is, well, who hates it? And what, you know, where, where, who's, who's going to push back on this? So that you have an idea what the conversation is. And, and if you have, if somebody in that situation doesn't tell me the truth, I'm not talking to that person again. Just not going to bother because we don't we don't need to do that. It's not we we don't we don't play games. I know I know it's going to be hard for some of you to buy, but we really don't. Uh, and and in committee, you know, we 
we all work together of whatever political stripe. On the, when once things come to the floor, there are a few bills and only a few where things get, can get rather polarized. But um, but in committee, for the most part, we we cooperate. And my my chair um, pointed out that we didn't have a we, our committee did not have a single bill last year that passed on a party line vote. There were there were there were dissents. We didn't pass everything unanimously, but the people who didn't like it were of all flavors. So. Um, you know, we we are all of my colleagues of whatever whatever stripe are always working to do what we think is the best thing for the state. We don't always get it right, but we but we try. So more questions, David. Uh, human services. <clears throat> How often do does somebody review criteria for a person to receive? whatever one of these programs might be. And second part is, who oversees the people that check out this criteria? Where I'm going is, I don't know as of today, but years ago, I know several abuses of people who were receiving human services that had no business taking money from the state. Okay, well first David, I will, I will um, send you the, I don't have it written down in front of me, but the, um, um, the phone number, um, there's a hotline for people who are cheating. Um, uh, the answer to your first question. I hope that's better than what we used to be, because we <laughs> reported someone who was doing it very badly, and they said we don't have time to deal with that. Well then. And then that was calling okay. Okay, so when that, directly. Okay, so when that happens, you get back to me and I'll go to the commissioner, or the, or the secretary. Um, uh, with respect to oversight, um, number one, all of the criteria are in rule. So we have statutes and we have rules, and the rules and the rules are done in another fairly deliberative process. They're 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 drafted by the department and they're they're reviewed by other government agencies. Well, we're not, no, they're drafted by the department. They go out for public comment. So um, there's a period of, I don't know, I think it's 60 or 90 days for, for you and, 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 and more particularly the advocates, the people who actually, what we, call the, what we like to call the stakeholders, to review them and say, you know, gee, number, number six you know, isn't going to work. And, and, they, and they send in written comments. Um, the agency then reviews the written comments and does a revision. When they've done a revision, they send it then to all of the other Government agencies, so the government, so so government agencies get to say, oh, you're putting, you know, you're shifting this from my but from your budget to my budget, and I don't like that, or I we don't have the manpower to do X Y Z or whatever. So that so how is it going to work within government as a whole? And then once it's gone through that process, it comes to something called the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules, LCAR. Um, they meet on every Thursday morning at eight o'clock all year. Well, uh, actually, in the off session, I think it's every other week. Um, if, if there are rules to come up, and they and you will hear you heard about them. Oh gosh, uh, with respect to I'm trying to remember what was, oh, that was, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to remember the, the specifics, but they're they're they are in the news from time to time with respect to, to rules. Um, so. Um, all of the eligibility workers um, are are supervised, and in fact, just a minute ago, I was talking about the nine position cuts. So, what they've lost is they've lost some of those supervisors. Um, so, you know, to save money, you know, and there, there were uh, you know, middle managers were probably rather well paid. I, mean, the, I think the rule of thumb is that you take take a salary and add another third to cover um, uh, fringe, you know, uh, healthcare, uh, vacation, sick time, all of that. So, so if so, if they were making sixty thousand dollars, it means they're costing the state ninety. So taking out ninety of them is, is a chunk of change to, to do something else with. Um, but but that was the supervision. Um, but they are there. Are, there are there are um, the people that that I would if I if I wanted heating assistance, I would call up and and I would do the application probably maybe online. Somebody would review that, um, and that person has has a supervisor um, has someone in-house who supervises and then and then central office has have people who oversee the whole program um, but the changes to the actual criteria 
you know, does, you know, just, if Sandy just made, is making $11,000 instead of 10000 does she qualify? That's, that is done at, at, at the level, at the rule level. How often is that reviewed or changed? Is it, is it looked at uh, yearly, 10 years? Well, I, I it's Or is look, there any number? I, do you, you mean that we should re revise them? Yes. Because I don't, well, if we were going to revise them, we would probably revise them up. Because, because right now we are working on, so let's talk, let's talk about our welfare program, which is called Reach Up. Um, Reach Up has, right now, we just had a, we just had testimony on this. I think there are, I think there are about 4,000 families right now in the state of Vermont that get Reach Up. Um, that may not include, there are, there are some children, there, there are some, like, like a child who is living with grandma might, might get, uh, get a benefit, but grandma doesn't, and we call that a child only case. So I'm not, I can't remember whether the 4,000 includes the child only cases, but it's, it's, it's in the, it's in about the 4,000 range. Um, thank you for coming. Come back, come again. I will. Um, thank you for being here. Um, sorry, I lost my train. Um, oh yeah, okay, so eligibility for that program, so I'm, so I am now, I, I will be, um, uh, the hypothetical of a uh, newly divorced 35-year-old, 35-year-old mother um, who has two kids, um, and uh, and let's say I wasn't working, uh, uh, and you know, they, first of all, they're going to they're going to go after dad to get as much from dad as they can. They're, that's that's the first piece, but um, uh, but they take they take a um, a need that is that's pretty close to poverty line, what they call a basic needs budget, and then they and then they and then they cut that in half, and my benefit is 49% of that number, and we have been at that 49% for as long as I can remember, and what did I hear the other day that we're actually using? I don't remember what year we're using. <coughs> we're not even using current poverty guidelines. So, <laughs> so if we were going to revise it, I think we'd revise it up, is my yeah. point. I have a quick question about the, oh, I'm sorry, you've tried several times, go ahead. No, it's okay. <laughs> uh, so most importantly today, I wanted to thank Nick and Neil and David for hosting this. Um, it's a great venue to talk to the legislators and to thank Sandy Haas for being here today. Um, that's all in celebration, but sadly I have to bring up some minutes from last June's um, legislative breakfast meeting. Um, there was a, an attendee from Rochester that um, made a comment. I went to speak and she interrupted my talking and said, Robert, I don't think the governor is interested in what you have to say. So in all my years of education, sports, religion, I've never been more motivated by someone interrupting a 30-year tradition by insisting that I am not welcomed to be listened to by the governor. So uh, the three things I wanted to talk about when I was interrupted were political leadership, political etiquette, and political transparency. And those three things that I wanted to speak about that I was disallowed to speak about through that attendee dovetailed into exactly what the governor spoke about for an hour and 15 minutes. So today is the first meeting of the, of the legislative breakfasts, and I hope more people will join us. So I had numbers of questions for Mr. Uh, our senator, Mr. McCormick, but since Sandy's here, I guess we're just going to focus them to Sandy, uh, this was a question for anyone that attended today. Do you consider your seat, in this case, as state rep, a leadership position? Um, so I, I, <coughs> I've heard you talk about this before. Um, it's a I, yes or no question. No, it's not. I'm sorry. Um, it depends. It depends upon the context, and I know that one of your concerns has been. 
um, t trying to tell the select board what to do, and I don't believe it's my job to tell the select board what to do. Um, uh, and it, I guess within the state house, I am considered a leader because I'm a vice chair. Um, I actually consider that kind of a minor position. Uh, I have I was caucus leader for one term, uh, a progressive caucus leader. I didn't like that actually, um, and um, so. Um, I, I think there are, I think I get things in the mail that call me an opinion leader. Um, I prefer to think that I listen to, to my constituents and, and to the state. I mean, let's, let's get real. This is, Vermont is, a, Vermont is a little state. I'm from San Francisco. I grew up in San Francisco. San Francisco has 650,000 people. Vermont has less. The entire state has fewer people than the city and county of San Francisco. So, um, so I consider that I that I that I work for the whole state. I certainly try to be sensitive, more sensitive to local issues. I know I have colleagues who say, "Oh, I only vote my district." Well, um, you know, sometimes voting the district means means doing something that isn't actually good for the whole state. Um, and uh, like like for example, if we were if we were citing uh, a, a new facility. And, and the town absolutely did, you know, not in my backyard. Uh, I don't, you know, that, that representative would probably vote no, but I don't know that that's, that I would consider that um, in the interests of the whole state. So, um, uh, so the answer to your question, Robert, is it depends upon the context. In my committee, I am definitely a leader. Uh, on the floor, on issues where, that I, where I feel like I have um, better expertise on an issue than others do. I am probably a leader um, in our in our in our town. I believe that my and in the district. I believe that my job is to be a conduit uh, between between the community and the state house. So um, we've talked a lot about issues at the state level, um, and you just mentioned the local local issues in our towns. So, I find it incredibly challenging, excuse me, Dave, to glean any of your opinions, input, advice, perspective regarding our schools, taxpayers' overwhelming responsibilities, supervisor union decisions, roads, school mergers, the issues up at Bingo happening today, the, the law of the taser use in our towns, the need for sat phones in our towns, car inspection rules, downtown development out of Quichi and land use. They're the local issues, but I guess my question is, how do you communicate with the Rutland-Windsor voting uh, community? Do you have a website? Do you, what, how, how, how do we know what you're doing about the issues <coughs> up, at, up at Bingo? Where, where do we go? Do we write you a letter? Do we email somebody? Um, Nick talked about how hard it is to get information from the state. Well, there's no quotes in newspapers. There's no, what, what about, what about all these local issues that I've been paying attention to for over a year now in school board meetings, select board meetings. I sit in them and see what happens. What, what is your take on all this? You know, Those are elected officials who are doing their job and I, and I give them the respect that I think they deserve. Uh, so you would rather not comment on any of these issues that are very local, but you're depending on the select boards of each town to communicate that? I'm, I'm confused. I'm trusting the select boards to do their job in the same way that I do my job. They have issues that come before them. They listen to the people who are affected. They listen to opinions. I, my, my voice is no more important than your voice, Robert, in what the, in what the Rochester or the Bethel Select Board does. The, I am, in Rochester, I am a citizen, and I handle myself as a citizen in the town. I, if you ask me my opinion, I will tell you. If it's something that I need to take up that you think needs, needs action at the state level, I will be happy to look at that. If you need, if you need um, uh, uh, interference, uh, a go-between with state agencies, I am happy to do that. But you know, Nick's, Nick's, if Nick is really having trouble getting through to whoever is supposed to be giving him help, 
Right. You know that I I can I can help I can help make those connections, and if we have a law that needs to be changed, I'm happy to to consider that to do my little slip of paper in the suggestion box and 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 push it as much as I can. But as you know, with five weeks left, I can tell you that a lot of those ideas aren't going aren't going anywhere. I don't know I don't know what your concern is. I, I I remember that during Irene, you were mad at me because. Because I didn't do I don't know what. I was and we mad had, at you. And I we was had, disappointed. We, and we, well, what we had. <clears throat> I live in Rochester, and Rochester probably had the best leadership on Irene, of uh, possibly any place in the state, and and there was no way in the world that I was going to step on their. You, you I'm not going to step on their toes. They're doing their job. And you want me to stand up and say, well, I think that Larry Strauss should be doing X, Y, Z. If I think Larry Strauss should be doing something different, I would talk to Larry. Okay. So over the last 14 years, what accomplishments are you most proud of? So it's been 14 years. Uh, I'm very proud of the end of life bill. We worked very hard on that. Um, and, I, um, and I was the reporter on that. Um, so what's um, bill, Sandy? The, um, the, I call it the end of life bill. It's the bill oh, that... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, I, I was, I was the, the reporter on that in two different cycles. Um, the reporter is the person who actually brings it to the House floor. Um, I'm especially proud of the work that we did on advanced directives before that. Uh, we continue to work on that. In fact, I have a bill that I'm trying to get. Sandy, what was that again? Advanced? Advanced directives. An advanced directive is the document that you, that you fill out um, that tells health care providers what kind of care you do and do not want. Um, we, we, people t tend to think of it as turn off the machines, but in fact, that's really not what it's about. It's really about, number, number one, um, you, you appoint an agent. So for instance, for me, my, David is, is going to be my number one agent. I haven't done mine, by the way. I'm, I'm saying that for the cameras. I've been thinking about this for 10 years, and I still haven't done it, because frankly, it's hard. Um, but How many people in this room? Oh, no, 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 don't embarrass me. Um, uh, <laughs> good for you, David. Um, uh, but David will be my agent. Uh, Patsy French in Randolph has agreed to be my, my, my backup. Uh, I, have, I have filled out all the things about what I care about. What I, what I find most <coughs> interesting about um, the, 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 the process, and gosh, if you guys want them, I'll bring, I'll bring a handful of booklets next time. I get the booklets, and then immediately they rewrite them, and they're slightly, <laughs> they're slightly out of date. So I have a lot of out of date booklets. That don't that the, the form so there's no particular form. Um, they've gotten a little bit more sophisticated with the information that they provide. I think um, that's a great. I think that's a great bill. I, I'm, I'm, that's a great accomplishment. So what are the other ones? Uh, so um, well, you know, so I'm part of a team. Uh, I don't. I, you know, there are the legislature is 180 people. There are 150 of us in the house, and there are 11 on our committee. I will tell you that I take a very active role in shaping every single bill that comes out of our committee. Uh, I, we, we pass around the, uh, the job of reporting bills. Uh, I also have worked very hard on the, on the medical marijuana bills. Um, we have done, I lose track of how many times we have tweaked that. Um, one of the things that we do at the, one of the things that I love actually about about the legislative process in Vermont is that is that we um, we take we, we, we take we take we, we do things in chewable bites. So so when when the idea so I talked earlier about the initiative process. So in most in if you think back 15 or 20 years, you'll recall that medical marijuana was something that was passed by initiative in other states, and you heard about it in the news because it was controversial. Um, we don't have the initiative process, so in Vermont, it, it had to be a bill. Um, and although the people who wanted it thought that it was a health issue and should be managed by the, oh, I can't see, um, should be managed by the Department of Health, um, the um, public safety, the Commissioner of Public Safety, was so unhappy about it. Um, he was. He said that if we did, if we had medical marijuana in Vermont, the Hell's Angels were going to take over. That was in 2004. I still haven't seen a Hell's Angel. Um, but um, 
But, but what, so what they passed was this very, very, very narrow, 2004, before I was there, um, uh, you had to have cancer or, or AIDS or something. I mean, there was like, it was like there were, there were three diseases, and, and that was it. And, and you had to grow it or get somebody, to, one person to grow it for you. That was it, pretty much. I mean, I, I, and, and, and it was going to be run by the Department of Public Safety. Um, a few years later, when I was in the legislature, they said, mm, kind of short list. How about, how about we expand the list a little? And we did. Mm, not, not enough plants. I think you were allowed to have one, one mature plant. And they said, you know, not all of us have a real green thumb, and that one plant doesn't always make it. So how about we get two plants? So I think we gave them two or three. I can't, it might even be three for the medical program. For the, for the legalization, it's only two. Um, and, and then, so that was, I think that was 2007. Then, um, then in, I think it was 2011, um, we had people said, you know, I'm, I'm 85 years old and I have cancer and how do I find a drug dealer? I got the card. <laughs> I got the card, but I don't know how to find a drug dealer. Right. So, um, so we said, you know, this really doesn't make sense because what we're doing is we're actually, we're actually encouraging people to go to the black market. So, so, um, so there was a proposal that was happily that year was was supported by the administration um, to have d uh, licensed dispensaries that were licensed by the state, and so we set up a very, very highly regulated structure that allowed the department, still the Department of Public Safety, to license dispensaries. So we have we have now we had um, uh, uh, Bra uh, Burlington. Montpelier, um, geez, oh, uh, Brandon, uh, and I'll think of the other one in a minute. Um, but not, not, not statewide coverage. Um, but, but again, it was a, it was a slow rollout, and, and, and there was, I think, there was a cap even on the number of patients that there could be. So, so, so then a few years later, we t we, we took off the cap. But so wait, my, my point is that we do this. We, 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 we try something, we see that, that the world didn't end, the Hells Angels didn't, didn't take over Vermont, and we say, okay, I guess we can take another step. And, and so that's, and I think that's what we're doing, frankly, with, with legalization. Um, where's the end of the life bill? I'm sorry, say it again. Where, where's the end of life bill? That was, that was pretty prominent mm -hmm. for a year or two. Or it's, that. it's, we, we, um, there's a report, actually. It's, if you go and look at reports, you'll see the report from the it, Department it, of Health. Well, well, talk to me about the public support. At one time there was uh, a great deal, and then it just seemed to wane. You know. Well, I, I, my understanding is that there's still public support. It's not something that most people are going to use. What I mean, it's I, so. So there was a report. Um, it just came out, I think, in October. Uh, my recollection is that they, there were 29 people who had actually died using the drug in almost in four and a half years or three and a half years. Of 60 uh, who. Uh, yeah, yes, and of uh, 60, oh, thank you, David, um, this is my secretary, um, um, 60, so, so I'll talk about the end of life bill for a minute. Um, so the deal is that if, if I am dying, if I have a terminal condition, so think cancer because that's what most of it is, terminal condition, I get, I have two doctors have to say that I have less, that, that they, that in their medical judgment, I have less than six months to live. So two doctors have to sign on. And prognosis is tough, folks. I don't know. If, I don't know. You know who you know, but prognosis is 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 not easy. And they have to they have to sign something that say that says that in their best medical judgment, I will not be here six months from today. Um, and um, and with that, then I I have the right to say I want medication to speed up my death. I have to ask once. I have to ask again in 15 days. I have to do it in writing. There's some form, some formal things around the writing, um, and and if I do all of that, then the doc, a, a doctor who is willing, and not all are. So hopefully one of those two who who did the who said who who hopefully one of the two who confirmed my condition is willing to make a prescription, can then write a prescription to me to get this cocktail of drugs um, 
it's, the and law it's very now. expensive. I'm yeah. sorry? That's the law yeah. now. That is, not that all is, that is the law. Prescription and not all pharmacies will fill it. Yeah, yeah. But 60 people have gotten permission, and of those 60 in these past few years, about half of them have used Actually, drugs. And the other half died on their, you know, died without it. They, they were glad to have it in the drawer if they got pain got to be so bad, if they wanted to die so badly, it was right there, and half of them said, no, no, no. So what are the changes that are being proposed to that? And None. Zero. None. Zero. Oh, okay. No, no. All right. No, no, but he was asking me, he asked me, he asked me for the things, for the last, oh. for his, for my history. So that's, the so, so, um, Mer actually, those two bills I think are great. Those, the end of life is a great one, medical marijuana, so that's two accomplishments. So are there any more that you'd like to add? Well, I, I will I will take some credit for um, for every bill that I voted for, including um, uh, uh, marriage equality, and for every bill that's come out of my committee, including um, our um, very um, uh, robust uh, program for uh, addressing the opioid crisis. That's the, those have come out of our committee. That's a good one. Um, I can't. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't think I was having to write a resume, so I don't have a list. <laughs> It's not a resume. Oh, I yep. didn't see the cameraman. <laughs> yes, I'm Mason Wade, uh, a resident of Rochester. I was hoping to ask all the legislators this today, but when it comes to state representatives and senators actually holding offices in towns, uh, what is the ethical relationship there? For an example, uh, Sandy, you hold a grand juror position. So now with these new marijuana laws, if I have five immature plants in the window, and you see that, what is your duty to the state as a grand juror and a state rep to deal with this? None. What, what, can you explain grand juror and why you hold that position in the town of Rochester? Uh, my understanding is that, well, so, so most of you know that there are some, there are times when a prosecutor is nervous about just charging somebody without kind of, yeah, I'm going to say, I'm going to say political backup. Uh, and, and so they impanel a grand jury. Um, you hear about it mostly at the federal level. Um, uh, I have been on that list for quite a few years. I don't remember when I was first elected. I have never been asked to do anything. I don't know that, uh, I, I take it back. Once, some, once the principal called me and said that it was part of the grand juror's duty to deal with truancy, but he never called back, and I didn't have to research it. No, no. That's what that's that was what the, that was what the principal told me. Um, but um, but but I don't um, but but I don't I do not consider that I have any uh, any law enforcement obligations at all, uh, and um, and I have never been asked to show up for a a, a grand jury would be uh, a body like the legislature that only that. That only operates as a body. It doesn't. The individuals don't have any any power. Um, so until they're until it, the grand jury is impaneled, I would say I have no no obligations. Mm -hmm. uh, just to follow up real quick, the Secretary of State's office uh, uh, writes about the grand juror, and uh, the grand juror is the job is to inform the state and local authorities on criminal matters. That's the job description that the Secretary of State has given in in uh, on web. Thank you. Other questions? I actually have a quick question yeah. about, the, I'm Lisa Campbell, I'm here from Bethel. Um, also, full disclosure, I'm reporting for the Herald. Um, but I have a quick question personally about um, the governor's budget. And uh, some of the, something I read yesterday concerned me about um, reducing the number of directors of observation, uh, um, operations in the Department of Children and Families. So is that, they're, they're talking about having one director of oper operations for two offices? Okay, so that's what I was talking about earlier with, with, um, with Dave Eddy. Okay. Um, it, that is specifically in the division, the Economic Services Division, not the Child Protection Division, which okay, I think good. is the one that, okay, thank that you, you have a greater interest yes, in. Yes, um, And, um, yeah, so, okay. so they were, they, they had, they had kind of, I'm gonna call them middle managers. Yep, um, yep. It's my understanding. If I can get the numbers over it, I may not, I may not remember this completely. It's okay. So they, they're, yeah. they're, they're central office people, you know, who kind of like 
they would, they, would, they would review the rules. The central office people would be looking regularly at the rules and saying, gee, gosh, should we tweak these? Do they work? Um, in addition to that, are they following the rules at the local level? Right. And, okay. and, then, um, and then it's my understanding that each of the 12 district offices had, you know, had, a, had a mommy, right? right. Had a, had a yeah. big boss. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and number one, um, as we are coming out of the recession uh -huh. ever so slowly, um, there, there are fewer, the, 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 our caseloads have dropped in, in everything, in, in food stamps. Okay. So, so food stamps, food stamps, the state does eligibility, but it's all federal money, but we still do the, we okay. still, you still have to satisfy somebody that you're entitled. Um, the, the reach up program that I talked about earlier, that's a much smaller number, the LIHEAP program, um, uh, the, uh, VSNP program to get your, <laughs> get, actually, do that yet? Yeah, no, I'm not even sure they have that. They may, but to get your, you know, to get to, for, for low-income people to get their 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 pets fixed. Um, so there's we have lots we have a lot of benefit programs that have different rules, pretty complicated and you know like how do you we, they've been working for years to try to come up with some some sort of coordinated eligibility for people and to reduce the form from 25 pages to seven. I mean it's it's. So, so there's somebody. So okay. there's a caseworker who gets my application. Right. There's somebody who looks over my shoulder, and I think there was somebody looking over her shoulder. So right. that's that. So what they decided was that a because the caseloads were reduced, okay. and b because they were they 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 are moving out of the twelve the twelve people in the district offices. Three of those positions are going to move to central office. So we'll, so there'll be there'll be more more supervision at the state level. And so that's that. So that what they're going to do is, people who are in central office then will each be responsible for two districts. Okay. For that that sort okay. of big oversight, right. and they're going to and and each each district office has um, has a boss. Right. It wasn't it wasn't a boss of economics. It was just an overall boss. Right. So there still will be some supervision. Okay. So that was this okay. was this was seen as a way to to sort of move some money from managers to. Services and and, right. and line staff. Right. Um, thank you. That helps. Um, the other question I have is: um, There's been some talk with the budget about um, mandating schools to have staff reductions. Do I do I have that right? And, and and can you clarify that at all? I or is that one of those things that's sort of up in the air this year with the legislative process? I mean, I will tell you. I also have a personal interest there. Just I will. I will tell you here. if I'm wrong. If I'm, I have made predictions here before that, that, that were wrong. Okay. If I'm wrong about this one, you can shoot me. <laughs> that will not pass. <coughs> okay. Um, that is a. That's something that the governor cares about, um, and and I and I guess the secretary of education as well. There certainly are, um, you know, probably national. I'm not going to call them guidelines because we usually think of guidelines as minimums rather than maximums. But, um, but th I think wh when you compare Vermont schools to schools in other states, we are staff heavy. Of course, we're staff heavy. We're rural. Yes. Uh, right. So, right. Yeah. You know, and um, and but you know, but but staff is where the money is. Staff is, sure. staff is, yeah. staff is what is yeah. the cost of education. Eighty percent of your budget. Yeah. Okay. So, so cut one one position, and you right. and you all right. So, um, so the governor, had, and actually, I think I think his predecessors too. I think I've been hearing this the whole time that we have too many people in the schools, too many grown-ups. Um, he would like to have us in a ratio. I don't. That's going to, I'm not, okay. I don't, personally, I don't see that happening ever, but okay. it will not happen. I'm quite positive it won't happen this year. Robert. Okay. Yeah, so I, you know, I was really curious about the riffing going on in the school. So, like, the phys ed teacher gets fired because of budgets, you know, and so on. But then if you look at the supervisory union, there's no riffing that goes on there. And I talked to the uh, general, uh, Joanne Benoit, about it and requested all the salaries of the 22 people that support the supervisory union right here over on the dump road. Um, so the schools, I don't understand why the supervisory union doesn't reduce their forces as they continue to redu reduce the teachers and the services at the school level. So 80% of the budget, the property taxes that we all pay, it goes to the school. 40% of that 80% goes to support um, uh, the supervisory union. 
this seems to be a total overbalanced situation. So I would rather see a phys ed teacher keep his job in, or she, in Rochester or Bethel than a web designer or some uh, communication person at the supervisory level. Uh, it just seems to be incredibly yeah, imbalanced. Well, I would like to speak to this. Go for it. Robert, you and I need to talk sometime. Well, that would be Other nice. I always enjoy with talking with you. Because I have, I have, your, your numbers are, I can show you different numbers. Okay. And, and why. Okay. Okay. Uh, no. But whatever. Is a supervisor too, it's, you're being old and older? That's no, a real question. No, we're not. As a matter of fact, we are, we are adding a staff member. We have a supervisor union with 22, 22 people. Oh, 22. Uh, we are like last in the country in our technology. We need to get that better. So we have a technology director and an assistant. They cover 10 towns. <clears throat> so everything from Stratford, Chelsea, to Rochester, Stockbridge, Bethel, Royalton, right. Dunbridge, they all, they all have to be covered. Uh, we have a business manager who handles <coughs> in excess of $40 million in budgets. And she, the one we have, which is now back because the, the, our return, our, the one we hired, quit. Don't I have to come back? Yeah, because they can't, it, people don't understand. Uh, it's going right back. She is right now. Yeah, but she has family. She's very well. Yeah. She's very, very good. Well, she was very responsive to me, but here's a question. This is a big one. So it was great. She gave me all the salaries of all the employees. Um, she told me the budget for the facilities that they are housed in is about $54,000 a year, which I thought, I was actually think surprised that the budget was lower than I thought it was. But this is a thing that happened last um, August in a, a merger meeting in Stockbridge. So there we were on a beautiful August 8th night uh, doing this marriage with Stockbridge and Rochester, and um, Mr. Labs is there, a consultant named Mr. Dale was there. There were probably 25 people there, and that meeting started at 7. By 8.40, <clears throat> there was a big eureka in the room because all the numbers that the supervisory union, through the consultant, delivering to the school system, were all wrong. All the numbers were wrong. The meeting ended in total questions. We all wasted a beautiful night. And the question I had to Susan and Mr. Labs is, how much does Mr. Dale get as a consultant to speak and represent the supervisory union who's making $121,000 a year? Why do they need a consultant to be at select or school board meetings to explain what the supervisory union is doing and then explain it with numbers that are totally incorrect? Save this question, and this, we don't have time to for me to answer that to you. Okay. Right now. <laughs> I have an answer for that. <coughs> so you know what Mr. Dale was saying. But at the, okay. at the okay. end, two have your negotiated <laughs> session. Would one of you report, report, report back to those of us who are also interested? Uh, in David could do that. <coughs> I could pre prepare something, but these folks might not all come because it's going to take the whole time. Yeah. Well, it's we're very complicated. I understand. That's why I'm saying he and I can talk some other time. But I'd like to answer that question too. As a matter of fact, I would entertain anyone sending me questions, and I could get it all together, all at once. I wish I knew about it. Rather than yeah. I'm the chair of the Bethel board. I serve on the uh, uh, supervisory board. I serve on the RTCC board. And I'm on the executive committee of it, of the. Uh, Are you glad board. you're running for school board? What's that? Aren't you glad the years are going to be running for school board? <laughs> July one <laughs> ends my services on three of those committees, and I will be on the Bethel board until we close out the books on Bethel School. It becomes the White River Valley Union District, which. Is well, having done that for a dozen years myself, I, I'm afraid that <laughs> I, got you, were, I got you. Mine's 13. Well, you you volunteered to do that. Uh, yes, I did. I, I personally appreciate that a lot. Uh, thank you. But I will say that anyone who wants to be on the school board, <laughs> don't run in there saying you're going to fix something right away. No. It takes a while to figure out what's going on, mm -hmm. who to talk to. 
and how to talk intelligently about it because it is very complicated. And actually, we find the same thing in the legislature. Very we have we have some freshmen this year who have who have put bills, brought in bills that they're that they're all excited about, and it's like we already do that, you know. <laughs> so. I had a conversation with somebody in the world, and, and uh, they started a, their dissertation with the comment that what they were going to do, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and you're all wrong. You, you don't do anything as an individual. I'm going to suggest that we try to do this. Yeah. So that works. Neil, we've gone past our time. Well, we've gone way past it, but if you've got a quick one, go ahead. Yeah, and I've given a speech about uh, eliminating Social Security tax. Do you know anything more about that? Uh, I, I, I know that it's a proposal. Uh, I, I actually I was going to look at my own tax return um, today, and I didn't get a chance. You know, there's a certain, for me at least, twenty-five thousand is is already exempt. So I'm not. I mean, it's it, one of the things that's people get confused about taxes, and I didn't get the chance to do. Twenty-five thousand of what is exempt? Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I can earn. $25,000 working. I can get a job and mm. pour coffee. Oh, you don't make $25,000. I can find something that pays $25,000. And, and, um, <laughs> I can find something that pays $25,000 and get my Social Security and it's not taxed. Right. Over $25,000 then. At a certain then, age. Not at 65. Uh, oh, oh. Sixty-five, you can earn fourteen-five. Well, well, that the. Been that, looking at that. It's coming up close. Okay. <laughs> well, Dave, I'm, I'm older. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so well, that's okay. So it's more complicated. So, it, like everything that we do, it's more complicated than it looks. Yes. Um, uh, I haven't, and I haven't heard what the price tag is. Is not. It's not a small price tag. You know. So, so again, you know, we do that. If we do that. Then what do we cut? You know, do we cut? Do we do we cut the number of state police on the highway? I don't think so. You know, so where where do we you know where do we get the savings? Um, but my point is that 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 there's already there's already what I consider a reasonably generous exemption, and then and even even for me, okay, well take me again. So so I make so I made twenty six thousand instead of twenty five. The 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 one the then then I bring in. Some portion of my social security and and pay tax on half of that. So it really it's it's not a big number. It's a, it's a great it's a great soundbite, but it's not a big number for me. But I've already paid taxes on this money that I put aside that I'm drawing now. Mm. Same in the, in, the, in the federal tax. Even. I think it was uh, I think I paid them uh, fifty six hundred dollars last year for my for the federal part of my social security. And we're getting a raise, and I think I got a twelve a ten dollar twelve dollar raise, but my thing went up ten dollars, so two dollars like that. Oh, oh, the uh, Medi Medicare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's so it's the governor has made the proposal. It's on the table. I don't know where it will go. I have the same thing with military. Mm -hmm. I really don't enjoy paying tax on uh, retirement. retirement benefits. Yeah. From the I don't know how they how they figure it, but we have been looking at states that are friendly to retirees. And Vermont is not. So so, so 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 we're not. Yeah. And the number the number they give on the, the federal data is uh, Vermont taxes about nine percent of your income after you retire for that kind of tax. Where I go to Wyoming, and Montana, Idaho, <coughs> Tennessee, North Carolina. Florida, Florida and pay nothing. So on that. okay, so I just want to be clear that that is one question, the Social Security. But we also found when they did the when they did the blue ribbon tax study a few years ago that I don't know if it's most states, but a lot of states we use taxable federal taxable income is, is what we is what we look at. Other states look at adjusted gross, and so it pulls out all of those deductions. And so so you need to look together. You know, like you may, yes, maybe they're nice to your social security, but 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 are you getting your other deductions? And I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. What is Vermont friendly on? <laughs> um, Weather. It's a great. <laughs> great question. Would you like to know? That's a great question. Community. Community. We have. Really? We have. We have. <laughs> and that helps me pay my taxes. <laughs> yeah. that helps it me helps you have. It helps you have a good life. 
Yeah. It helps you with a good My life. son just bought a new house in Tennessee. He paid three hundred fifty thousand dollars for it. Four bedroom, three bath, two car garage, two acres of land. His tax at thirteen hundred dollars a year. You think he can do that mistake? Okay, so I just got. I gave him six acres up behind me, and his tax at fifteen hundred dollars on that, and there's nothing there. Why do you think they left the state? Okay. You think he's coming back? No way. So, that I can't afford to live here. I just got a I just got a postcard in the mail um, on um, uh, how states take care of their elders, and um, and. Um, Vermont was in the top quartile and Tennessee was in the bottom quartile. So that's the, one of the ways. <laughs> yeah, but you don't want to go, but you can't go live with your great, go there to live and be with your grandchildren. Yeah. I mean, so it, you know, we, there are trade offs. And we, we, we make, we as a state have made a decision that we want to be community friendly to take care of people in need. You know, we used to have, we used to have the poor farm and then we said, oh, gee yeah, gosh. Back. Gee gosh, you know, let's 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 do that, and we don't we don't have <coughs> county government in other states. Everything, the, a lot of the stuff I've talked about would be done county by county. We do it statewide. Are there are there and there's some disadvantages to that. We have a hard, really hard time um, making sure that everything is 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 equally done around the state, and that's one of the things we look at a lot. Is you know, so I'm from Bennington. You can't do this in Bennington, you know, and and that's one of you know. So we're we're all there, and we make the, our committees have um, representation from all over the state so that we can really keep an eye on how how we are doing at making sure that whatever decisions we've made, policy decisions we've made, are, are, are that people are benefiting and paying at the same rate all around the state that it's equal. Okay, Neil. I uh, <laughs> I'm ready to leave. <laughs> so let's adjourn. And, uh, obviously, there are enough questions and enough interesting things to comment about so that uh, that should inspire 30 more years. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, 30 more years, Neil. Are you ready? Uh, back, back a minute for, to the, uh, so back to the legislative website. Um, I, I could give you my email, but it's, but it's tedious. Um, um, if you go, if you can look at put Haas in there and you'll find me and then you can click on it. It'll be way easier than, I don't know about you, but I make spelling errors when I type in. Is that Vermont.gov, you said? Vermont.gov. Vermont.gov. So Lots of information there. February 26th, we'll be right back here again, I hope. Yes, and at least one senator will be. I certainly will be. <laughs> and I'm a good representative, so. Thank you all. Thank you. You've been a very, a very um, engaged, engaged group. I've enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.